Let us pray. Well, Father God, it is wonderful to sing of your mighty power. And more specifically, as we do that, to look to creation to see your mighty power. Oh Lord, so much of what we can know about you, we can know from looking at the world around us, the world that you created, and more specifically, the world that you created for us, for us to have dominion over, for us to enjoy. Lord, we can look to nature, we can say, wow, that is beautiful. And we can say, Lord, God, you are beautiful. And we can also look to nature and we can say, wow, Nature is a mighty force, powerful force. And we can say, yes, Lord, therefore you are mighty and you are powerful. And to sing a song of praise that acknowledges not just the mighty nature of creation around us, but of your mighty nature, of your sovereignty over all things. It's a wonderful blessing. We come in and we make small talk, Lord, and so often that's focused on weather and sometimes that's complaining about the weather. And, and, Lord, that's fine to do, but we recognize that even the worst weather, the worst snowstorm or the worst rainstorm or the worst hurricane, whatever it might be, Lord, those are ordained by you. The rules that govern those forces of nature are held together by you and rooted in you, Lord. What an absolute blessing to know that you are mighty over creation and therefore mighty over our lives, sovereign over our lives, that all good things and all bad things, they are ordained by you, Lord, for our good, for our benefit, because you love us, because you care for us. And we see that most mighty act of your power over nature. When the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, rose again, that is mighty power, Lord. And we are thankful that through that death and resurrection, we might experience your power as a blessing. And that we might have a heart for those who may only experience your power as judgment. Lord, as we come together this morning, let us be equipped to be ministers of reconciliation, to go into the world and to enjoy its blessings, but also to see those that will encounter your might in a very negative way and do everything we can, compelled by the love of Christ and the power of his resurrection, to reach those people, that they might sing praises when they sing of your mighty power. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we have the blessing and privilege to turn to Matthew chapter 20 for our scripture reading. Matthew chapter 20, and we'll start with verse 20 this morning in the Gospel of Matthew here. We see Jesus here in the full swing of his ministry getting closer to the end, and he has an interesting encounter here with a concerned mother of two of his disciples. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us pray. 
And Father God, we ask that you would bless the reading of your word this morning. We ask that you would bless us as we come to understand this text. And we see here this power struggle, this desire of the disciples and, and even the occasional mother to, to determine the pecking order, to determine the hierarchy in Jesus' kingdom and who will rule and reign with him. And we see Jesus Christ clearly teaching principles that are true of the disciples and true for his kingdom, yes, but also true for us today in the body of Christ. We see teaching here principles of leadership, that those who would lead, they are not to be served, but to serve. And we see him pointing to the example that he would soon give as he gives up his life for his disciples. He gives up his life for all those who, by faith, would call him Lord and turn to him to see him as Savior and friend. Father God, I pray that in this congregation you would give those of us who have, you have called to a position of leadership, that you would give us hearts of service, that we would be serving servant leaders, that you would give us hearts and minds that ask the people not to make sacrifices to them, but you would give us hearts to sacrifice for them, to give anything and everything in service of the people here that we might in fellowship and community, truly reflect what it is to be the community of God, to be the body of Christ. I pray for our local leaders, the magistrates, as Scripture might call them, those in governance over us. Lord, I pray that you would give them biblical wisdom, those seeking that and even those who aren't seeking that. Lord, give them biblical wisdom that they might properly protect our ability to worship you and to serve others in the name of Christ. I pray for our state leaders, the same thing, that you would give them wisdom, that you would guide them in their direction, that they take our state, their larger community that we're a part of, that you would give them hearts of a servant. And Lord, I pray for our national leaders, Congressmen and women, senators, for President Joe Biden. Lord, I pray that you would give all of them wisdom as well. That you would give them spirits that are geared towards serving people. And not to be served. To give of themselves to others. And not to gain as much as they can from others. To use the systems and the rights and the privileges they have as our magistrates to bless us, not to harm us, to make freedom, to practice our religion as Christians in this country, which is so fundamental and foundational to who we are as a nation, to make that possible, that we might continue to share the gospel. But I pray that you would protect those leaders as you give them that wisdom but that they would also know swiftly and clearly your judgment when they stray from your will and your path, Lord. Father God, we pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the only announcement I really want to uh, mention is that <clears throat> next week we have a fifth Sunday. On our fifth Sundays, we usually have a special offering that's given and next week, that's to Bible Doctrines to Live By, which is a ministry that uh, does a lot of wonderful things in publishing and providing resources. And um, the little bit I know, the little bit I see makes it pretty clear that um, their budget seems to shrink and shrink every year. And they uh, are faithful stewards of what they're given and, uh, and do some good work. So just keep in mind, next week, a special offering for them. If you have a little bit of extra you like to give to them, I know it's a wonderful ministry. And, I know they appreciate churches like us that haven't forgotten them, that haven't uh, sort of abandoned them in ministries like theirs as we continue to uh, bless them financially but also through our prayers. So I keep them in mind this week and as we come to next Sunday. At this time, I'll turn it over to our worship team for an instrumental and we'll do another hymn before the message.
Oh, what a great, great hymn. One of my favorites since middle school. I really started going to church and understanding the Bible and Scripture and Christ and the Gospel. And always been one of my favorites, so always glad when we sing that one. I feel like it's been a while since I've sung that one or really even heard that one. Uh, so, yeah, certainly enjoyed worship this morning. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate it. We come this morning to a message that I'm really excited for, and the text isn't exciting all the way through, at least at a first glance, but it gets pretty exciting, and I'm pretty excited about it. I'm a big fan of folk music, especially like working songs. Uh, I love, for example, sea shanties, which is sort of a weird maybe genre of music to enjoy, but it, it's one I enjoy. And so my sermon prep was accompanied this week, not just with my my sermon prep playlist on my computer that I have of worship that doesn't distract me too much. And, uh, so it was a mixed of that and some sea shanties, and it was an interesting experience to just enjoy some songs of the sea. Because, well, that's where we're going this morning with the Apostle Paul. We are embarking on what is really a fantastic adventure as we come to Acts chapter 27. We find the story of a storm, and we find the story of a shipwreck as the Apostle Paul is on his way to Rome. And this passage here is one of the more vivid writings that we have really in all of Scripture. Maybe not the most vivid, but it's, it's up there. The Holy Spirit has gone into such great detail on this passage that historians and archaeologists have studied this text for its value as as a commentary on the techniques of ancient seamanship. This text shows how people conducted themselves on the seas, particularly in a time of crisis and stress. And in addition to that, this text has value because it teaches us about the providence of God. (coughs) We see who's really in control. We remember how the Lord Jesus Christ calmed the wind and the waves, and now we see God, the Father, just as easily stir up the winds and waves for his own end. When it pleases God to calm them, to make himself known, he does that. And when it pleases him to stir them up to make himself known, he does that. But beyond the technical value of the passage and beyond the providential value of the passage as it reveals God, there is the value of the passage as it reveals the man Paul. And as we've been going through Acts, at least the last two-thirds of Acts, we really see this as a study not just of early Christianity, but an in-depth look at the Apostle Paul. And sometimes it can seem... It can seem like we focus too much on the Apostle Paul, and it's important to recognize that he's a man, he's a fallen human being, and he makes mistakes, but he is also the one singular apostle to our church, to the body of Christ. And so it's worthy to study him as the apostle, and specifically what he reveals about God, what he reveals about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can see here the providence of God, and we can see the actions of one apostle named Paul. I think the true metal of a man comes forth in the fires of testing. And you can tell what a man is in crisis because the crisis will tell you what he is and who he is. And so here we have in the story, as we'll see, a man who's in crisis. And I don't suppose in all of Paul's life there was ever a more prolonged and intense and unrelenting crisis than the one we have here. There's been maybe more serious situations. There's been moments where Paul is either stoned to death or stoned nearly to death, and so maybe more severe, but in terms of prolonged crisis, this is maybe the best story we have for the Apostle Paul. A long time with little break in it. He endures day after day and week after week and month after month in this particular journey from Caesarea to Rome. As we go through this journey, just as a side note, as I read this text, there are a lot of names and specifics in this text that I'll probably say wrong, and so feel free to 
not worry too much about that in this text, but that's a side note. And we see the Apostle Paul here really is finding every day in his life, or every day his life hangs in the balance here. First it's sickness, and then it's stormy wind and waves, and then it's sword-bearing soldiers, and a poisonous snake. And it's one thing after another. And we'll see these things in detail as we read the text together and go through it verse by verse. But he is imperiled from the beginning of the journey to the end of the journey. And yet in all this, we see that this man, the Apostle Paul, is calm and he's courageous and he's confident. And all three of those things aren't rooted in him, but they're rooted in the God he worships and the God who he belongs to, as he'll mention later in the text. All the while, he shows himself also to be a leader, not because he has that title. Remember, he's not a leader here. He's not the Apostle Paul. He's the prisoner Paul at this point, at least in the perspective of most of the people on this journey with him. He's just a prisoner. He's a stranger to them, and yet he emerges as a leader. He emerges as somebody who leads, and that's what makes a leader. Not their title, but whether or not they actually lead. Paul starts out this trip as a prisoner. He's the lowest of low on the ship. And at the end of at least our portion this morning of this text, he ends up commanding everybody, including the captain, the sailing master, even the Roman centurion here. By the time this thing is over, he absolutely runs everything. He leads. And you'll find as we conclude our study in the days to come, the weeks to come, that the characteristics of leadership that make for true spiritual leadership are all exemplified in the life of Paul. His life here at the end of Acts is a tremendous lesson in the qualities of a leader who operates on the basis of godly leadership in the midst of tremendous crisis. In order to best digest this large passage, I'll be taking it sort of one section at a time, or one stage of his journey at a time. And it'll help us, I hope, to not get too lost in the details uh, as we sort of take it bite by bite here. Uh, There are a lot of details here, and (coughs) I'll be honest, the... Some of my temptation is to sort of gloss over pretty quickly some of these things. And the other temptation I have is to spend way too much time on some of these details. And so I'm hoping to strike somewhat of a, a healthy balance as we look at this text. Uh, there, is, there are a lot of books open on my desk right now of uh, history and seamanship and commentary, trying to understand some details here. And, and there's some rich stuff to enjoy here. And I've sort of got a mental map, but I think maybe my biggest, my biggest regret here will be not printing out a map for you guys to look at because it's pretty interesting. But I think, uh, I think we'll do well. Just to start with stage one, to start verses one through eight really is that first stage here. You know, Paul, just as a, a lead into that, Paul has had a Holy Spirit-led desire to go to Rome. And he's had that desire for a really long time at this point. And he never lost confidence in God's fulfillment of that plan. He was warned by people, he was warned by the Holy Spirit, that going to Jerusalem to give them that financial offering from the mostly Gentile churches or the non-Jewish churches that he started or visited, as he goes to give that financial gift to the church in Jerusalem, that he would be bound in chains. It went from this general feeling from the Holy Spirit that things would be bad to being directly told prophetically, that if you go to Jerusalem, you will be bound in chains. And of course, that's exactly what happens. And after two years as a prisoner, against whom no real criminal charges have been given, he finally appealed to Caesar and set this journey in motion. So, we come to our passage, Acts 27, starting with verse 1. And when it was decided that we should set sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramitium, which was about to set sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. 
<coughs> we'll stop there. <coughs> now forgive my cough that's been here since I'm thinking about Thanksgiving. It just will not go away. I feel great, but the cough's still here. So. If we look carefully enough at this verse, at this text, we are reintroduced to a character who's been missing from the story for quite some time. You'll notice him here. It says, and when it was decided that we should sail. When it was decided that we should sail. Well, there's the character that's been missing for quite a while now. That we indicates that the author of Acts, Luke, is back with Paul again. Luke was with Paul up until Acts 21, verse 18. He's with Paul basically up until his arrest or his time coming into Jerusalem, slightly before he's arrested. And Luke had probably been living in Caesarea or close by, and now at the end of that time, Luke joins Paul again. And then there's the indication of verse 2 that a new character is joining the story or joining Paul's little group here, and that's Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, who also accompanied Paul. So Paul's trip to Rome was in the company of two very dear friends, two Christian brothers, Luke and Aristarchus. And the interesting thing about this is that it was certain, uh, certainly not common practice to allow a prisoner who's being transported somewhere to have companions for such a trip. That's basically unheard of. <coughs> And as I studied this a bit, historians have pointed out really two possible ways to explain how this could be allowed. One, they would have to take the positions of slaves of Paul. If you were a Roman citizen and a prisoner and be transported, it's likely, not always guaranteed, but it's likely that they would allow your slaves, your servants, to come with you for that process. And so perhaps Luke and Aristarchus said, oh yeah, we're his slaves, we're his servants. And maybe that's how it happened. Or second, maybe Festus, knowing the innocence of Paul and wanting to secure his good reputation with Rome, gave Paul this courtesy. That's really the other option. But whatever the reason, Luke and Aristarchus do accompany Paul. And I think this is an indication of true brotherly love. And such love for a brother and sister in Christ is is not measured in feelings. It's measured in sacrifice. Christian love, Christian unity, is almost always measured in what we're willing to sacrifice for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't see that. We don't sense it a lot. I think our love these days is so often just rooted in our feelings for each other, our affections for each other, which is fine and perhaps a good start, but I think the reason we set so much disunity in the church is partially because we don't see love as a sacrificial act. We root it in our feelings, and, and so much of that gets wrapped up in our intellect and our disagreements and our petty squabbles. And we forget to sacrifice for each other. This isn't a cruise that they're on. This isn't a vacation that they're on. This is a long, tedious journey. Even without knowing that everything's going to go wrong, which I don't think they know, there's no indication that Paul says, hey, if you want to come with me, there's going to be a storm and a shipwreck and a snake. He doesn't say that, at least in the text. But even without that, the decision to come with the Apostle Paul is a decision of sacrifice. It's a true commitment to a lot of pain and a lot of hunger and a lot of discomfort and a lot of boredom, at the very least. And yet, they joined him on this crowded and uncomfortable ship. They did it because of their love of their brother, Paul. I think one of the major differences between a leader and a spiritual leader is the element of love. And these men love the apostle and are willing to sacrifice their own lives. Spiritual leaders, I think one sign of a good spiritual leader is not only that he has followers, for lack of a better word, but he has people who love him and will sacrifice for him. Not in a cultish sort of way, but in a Christian sort of way. Now we also see in verse 1 that Paul and some other prisoners were given over to Julius, a centurion of the Augustan cohort. 
Augustus is a title for the emperor. It, it translates to sacred or exalted. It's an empirical title. This cohort was a band of men assigned to the emperor. They were special envoys or couriers. It doesn't mean they're necessarily bodyguards directly of the emperor, but they serve him in a special and unique capacity. And uh, I think they're rooted in the sort of Roman secret police that existed at this time. I, I forget the Latin name for it. I didn't write it down. Uh, but there was this sort of secret police that formed from these people who were in charge of grain and escorting grain throughout the emperor, uh, empire. And eventually they morph into these special servants to the emperor. In the same way that we have a secret service that performs an entirely different function now than it originally started out as sort of guardians of currency in our nation. And so there's this special force, this Augustan cohort that is ruled or in charge of the Apostle Paul and with him on this. And there's a centurion there, Julius. And we don't know if all 100 men under Julius's rule or leadership are there. It's probably unlikely that they're all there, but a good number of them would be there escorting the Apostle Paul. This cohort of soldiers and Julius and Paul and his companions and some other prisoners all embark, as it says here, in a ship of Andrometium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, that is Asia Minor. This was a coastal vessel out of this place, Andrometium. Some ships were built for the open sea, while others, like this one, would just sail the shallow waters of the coast. And so they boarded this particular vessel to hop from port to port until they would finally run into a ship that was going directly to Rome. And so that's their intention, going from ship to ship trying to get to Rome, which would have been a sort of common way of travel at this time. We come then to verse 3. The next day we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. They left Caesarea. They sailed up the coast 70 miles to Sidon. And Julius is kind to Paul. And I couldn't help but wonder why such kindness is shown. Julius must have had a good reason to trust Paul. Because the penalty for losing a prisoner is having to serve that prisoner's sentence yourself. If you're in charge of getting a prisoner from point A to point B and you lose him, then whatever sentence they would have given to him is given to you. You serve that sentence. And, and so there's a lot of power that comes with being promoted through the ranks of Rome, but there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of risk. And, and we've seen that as we've been exploring these stories with Paul on trial, that these Governors of Judea act in some peculiar ways because of how the law interacts with them as sort of legal guardians of Roman citizens. And so he must have had some level of trust in the Apostle Paul to allow him to go, not just off the ship, but to go specifically to a group of his friends in Sidon. Friends in Sidon. You know, perhaps Festus, knowing the innocence of Paul and deep down in his heart wanting to do the best he could for Paul, Maybe he told Julius that this is an innocent man that he could trust in. Perhaps Julius somehow found out that Paul, more than any of them, really wanted to go to Rome. And so he had no reason to flee because he's now got a free passage to Rome. For whatever reason, Julius trusts him enough and is kind enough from the earliest parts of this journey to the Apostle Paul. He's allowed to go to Sidon. And there's a church there in Sidon. Those are the friends mentioned in verse 3. Friends was a common designation for Christians at the time. So why does he go to these friends? Perhaps he preaches and teaches, as he often does. I think if given the opportunity, he certainly would have done that. But we see in the text that he goes to be cared for, or he goes to be refreshed. In Greek, this is a medical term. He went to get treatment for some sort of ailment. They're 70 miles on this boat, and they stop here in Sidon. And the Apostle Paul is sick. He's ill, and we're not told exactly what's wrong with him. Just that he goes for medical care to the church there in Sidon, to his friends there. He's been held captive for the past two years and probably not treated that well. And 
There's very little in way of proper care or diet or rest on board a Roman ship. And so Julius lets Paul go for healing. Verse 4 and 5. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. They took an unusual route. Uh, when you look at the path they take, it's not the normal route you would take if you're trying to get to Rome from Caesarea. They took a different route because of some strong winds. The strong winds forced them to stay a little bit closer to the coast than they would have otherwise, even though it's a a coastal vessel they're on. They could have veered a little bit to go one way, but they go a different way. They stick as close to the land as they can, as close to the hills as they can, because those hills would block the strong wind that was affecting travel. And they're on a Roman ship, which is a single mast vessel with a square sail. It's not the best sailing vessel. They haven't perfected that. Rome is a great and powerful empire, but sailing isn't necessarily their strong suit. And so they are on this big, clunky ship. And so the wind controls the ship a lot more, what the ship can do, a lot more than vessels like today, which understand the science of things and have advanced so that the sails can really utilize winds a lot more than these vessels could. So they're on this clunky ship, and the wind takes them this different route. And it's estimated, if you consider the time historically that Festus is considered to take over, it's historically estimated that they'd be sailing in mid-August or a bit later, which would put them close to what was known as the treacherous season. Sailors would call it the treacherous season or the dangerous season. And that started halfway through September, and it lasted to halfway through November. There was never a certainty in the dangerous season or the treacherous season. It was never a certainty whether the wind and the weather would be good for sailing or bad. You could never really know. And so it was always a gamble to sail in this time. And after mid-November, nobody sailed. Nobody sailed after mid-November up until all the way to March. There was no sailing happening then because the weather was just terrible. You just... I mean, maybe if you had to go a short distance, you could maybe do it, but it would be awful, it would be dangerous, and it'd be better to just walk than to sail. And so they're in this dangerous time, and they're quickly approaching the, the no-sailing period. We get to verse 6. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. <coughs> So they change ships there in Myra, likely boarding what I believe is probably one of Egypt's many grain ships. Egypt is essentially the breadbasket here, and so most of the ships that would be Alexandrian or Egyptian would be carrying grain. And so they board this grain ship. In verse 7, we sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus, or Cnidus, and as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete, off Salmoni. They very slowly sail west. And they're sailing against the wind. And they arrived to the port of Canidus. But the wind made it impossible to dock there. They had two harbors there, but their ship, being clunky and being hard to maneuver, couldn't find a way to get into either of those harbors. And so they tried getting to Crete to find calmer winds. Verse 8. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Now this part of the journey was difficult. It's a 140 mile long island, Crete is, and they just wanted to turn the edge and get into shelter. And so with great difficulty, they finally made it, and they come to a place called Caluas Laminas, or translated to Fair Havens, which sounds a lot better than it is. You read that and you think, oh, they're finally in safety. But it's maybe safer, but it's not really the best place to be. And so now we come to stage two. So if stage one is the start, stage two is the stay. Here they are, and they're staying in Fair Havens taking on supplies and waiting for the wind to change. That's all they can really do is wait for the wind to change. 
And they're getting anxious to go to Rome, to go to Rome before the sailing season ends. Remember, they're at this point leaving in mid-August. So by the time they arrive here, it's getting late and they're well into the dangerous season. So they want to get to Rome before they can't sail anymore because then they're stuck wherever they are. If winter comes, the whole crew needs to be taken care of, needs to be paid, needs to be provided for, needs to be fed for the next four months before they can leave whatever harbor they're in. And so they're anxious to leave. They're anxious to get to Rome. In addition to that, to be stuck in fair havens would be absolute disaster. It was exposed to the winds of the sea. It was not a harbor of commodities, and there's nothing happening there. There's no fun, no games, no entertainment. There's no way for the captain to really make money to pay the idle crew for the time, other than to say, I can't pay you, go find a job. And there's not going to be a lot of work there to do because an influx of people in a small little harbor town like this is not good for the economy there. It doesn't work that way. And so the crew were interested in taking a risk and sailing on. We see that in verse 9. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them. We'll stop there. It says, much time has passed, and we don't know exactly how long that is, maybe weeks, maybe more. I think it's probably at least a month. They're probably there just waiting for the winds to change. And notice it says the voyage was now dangerous. Okay, well, that's another clear indication that we're in the dangerous season, the dangerous times to sail. And the notation that Luke makes now is that they're in the dangerous season, but they're in a period of time where, uh, where the fast was already over. The fast is a reference to the Day of Atonement, to Yom Kippur, the Jewish fast. Yom Kippur occurs on the 10th day of the 7th month of the Jewish calendar, which is the month of Tishri. That falls into the Roman calendar at the end of September or the beginning of October. In AD 59, which historians believe is the year we're talking about now, AD 59, we know that Yom Kippur was on October 5th. So assuming historians have the correct year, and even if they don't, this date would be fairly accurate. If we assume we have the correct year, then it's past October 5th. Remember, mid-November is when the cutoff point is. That's when you stop sailing. That's when dangerous season is over and no sailing season begins. But any attempt now would really be a gamble. And they want to risk it. Maybe the winds have changed, but they're still not sure if it's going to be good. Or maybe the winds haven't changed yet, and they're still wanting to take this risk. And so what happens is Paul admonishes them. Paul is no sailor by trade, but he has sailed these very seas, these areas, these locations, these harbors and ports. He's been in and out of them on his missionary journeys, and we can maybe even assume his life before that, as we're somewhat close to home for Paul. He's experienced multiple shipwrecks in his life. We see that in Corinthians. He's not looking forward to another. So he admonishes them. Verse 10. He says, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. You know, cargo might get damaged. People could get hurt. People could die. It's best to stay put. Now, Paul wanted to be in Rome more than any of them. He was eager to go. Even as a prisoner, he was ready to go to Rome, but he doesn't let what he sees as God's vision for his life stop him from also having wisdom, biblical, godly wisdom. And so this is a practical man. and We see here another quality of a leader. Not only is a leader loved by people, but you see here another quality is that a leader says what needs to be said. Even if it's not necessarily to their benefit, a leader says what needs to be said. And of course, since he wasn't anybody who was supposedly in control or knew anything about sailing, it says this in verse 11. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Now, owner here might better be translated as captain. The word could mean captain or it could mean owner. If you're the owner of the ship, you're likely the captain. So it could go either way. 
So the captain and then the navigator did not listen to Paul. And the centurion agrees with them. And you can't really blame the guy. They're the experts, and Paul is not the expert. But really push them to this decision is not necessarily an understanding of the weather patterns and the sailing conditions. We see it in verse 12. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. There's no way, there's no way that they're going to get to Rome at this point. But still, they did not want to get stuck in a dump like Fairhaven's. So they're willing to take the risk. And the crew comes along and they support the decision to sail on and try to reach Phoenix or Fonica. And that's some 40 miles away. It's a reasonable journey. They thought, well, if we can't get to Rome, maybe we can get to Phoenica, to Phoenix. And it would be good to harbor there. And that's true. Historians tell us at this time that the only place in winter that was comfortable to stay in and to live in was Crete, was that island. And so they're trying to get there. So they depart. And that brings us to stage three of our journey. That brings us to the storm. Verse 13. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, the winds they're waiting for, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. Well, all of a sudden, that wind that had made such a problem for them stopped. And you know what happened? Some lovely, little, gentle south winds began to blow, which is really nice. I mean, it's, it's terrific, the south winds to carry them right up to Crete. It's exactly what they needed, exactly what they wanted. And so verse 14 but soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. Okay, so things change pretty quickly. A severe northeast wind came blowing. Mm -hmm. The word here for Northeaster is actually a blend of Greek and Latin. It was the word Eurocliden, Eurocliden, which was a truly infamous wind. It's the most feared wind of all winds. The sailors would have known of this. The captain would have known of this. The pilot, the navigator would have known of this. And at the very name of it, some of them would have shaken in fear at it. And yet they decided to press on. They didn't see this as an issue. And yet it came. This is not just a wind. This is hurricane or typhoon-like winds that this area was known for. It's not just a simple rainstorm. This is scary stuff with all the concurrent airflow that comes together and swirls the clouds and swirls the sea. This is what they're in the midst of, like a small hurricane. There was a great fear among all those who sailed the Mediterranean, and the fear was of the Eurocliden because Eurocliden would send ships to the graveyard, and the graveyard had a specific name, the Greater Certus, this place where this great wind, this great storm would carry the ships and break the ships apart, and they would sink there, and crews would die in the middle of the sea here, almost helpless. And so whenever a great northeastern wind would come, of hurricane and typhoon-like dimensions, it would blast ships into the greater Sirtis, and it would reef them there and shatter them and smash them, and lives would be lost there on the coast of North Africa. And so surely they're afraid, and they had two options. If the hurricane didn't dump them into the sea and capsize the ship, then the hurricane would drive them into the graveyard of ships known as the Great Sirtis. Verse 15 and 16. Now things are really getting exciting. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Verse 16. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. So in other words, it didn't capsize the ship drove her into the sea, didn't capsize the ship immediately. That's the best news possible. Best case scenario is they go to the graveyard of ships and die there, so they get a few extra minutes or hours of life. 
It began to drive south and west, and they let it go. 23 miles from Fair Havens, where they started, was a small island called Cauda. And it's near there that they did three things. First, they secured the ship's boat. Now, these are some of the details I'm sort of alluded to earlier when we say historians looked at this to see how they handled sea travel. And so first they, secu they secured the ship's boat, the small boat, the little dinghy, if you will, that would carry people from the boat to shore if the waters were too shallow to bring the ship in, if there's no harbor there. So the little boat that would ferry people from ship to land or that would serve as a lifeboat if the ship broke apart. That little ship, which was a very important thing to hang on to, they couldn't just keep it where it was, tied to the stern of the ship, tied to the back of the ship. And so they had to bring it onto the ship or inside the ship so that it doesn't fill with water. Because if it fills with water, it weighs the boat down, and then the rope attaching it, the rope dragging the ship, wouldn't be able to hold this boat there any longer. If the rope would snap and the boat is lost. And so they bring it in. They manage to get it in. And so that's that's good. They're doing good so far, despite the fact that they're doomed and they're going to die. Uh, verse 17. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear. And thus they were driven along. Okay, so they do another good thing. What they did was they tightened these cables that were wrapped around the hull of the ship. And what that would do is it would better uh, distribute the stress that the ship was experiencing. And if they didn't focus that stress to other stronger points of the ship on these Roman ships, which again, not the greatest, it would put all the strength on the center mast of the ship and all the stress would go there and it would creak and the wood would start to pull apart until eventually very quickly the ship would snap in half. And so they tighten these things around there. I don't know how, but somehow that distributes some of the stress along stronger points of the ship or throughout more of the ship. And so they managed to do that, which is difficult. It's difficult to do these sort of things in a storm. One of the reasons I like sea shanties is because there are these work songs that these, these men would sing, men who are more manly than I could ever wish or hope to be, who did incredibly hard things, would sing these songs to just keep in rhythm and do these impossible tasks just to stay alive. And so that's what's happening here. Maybe they're singing. We don't know. Maybe they're singing as they're tightening these cables and repairing the ship and hoping to survive. And third, they're afraid of sinking in the Sirtis, this graveyard of ships. And so they lowered the gear, perhaps meaning that they lowered the main sail and they just drifted and they're tossed about by the wind and waves, unable to see and unable to navigate. Look at verse 18 and follow. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. So they're dropping things off the ship less weight on the ship to be easier to carry on the waves. Verse 19, and on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, excuse me, for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. They do this step by step by step. They're doing all the right things just to survive, and they're in this. And we see that it's not just a couple hour storm. They're in this tempest. They're in this typhoon for days, and they're just drifting, and they can't see where they are, and they don't know if land's in sight or land's right next to them or far away. They have no idea where they are, and they can't see the stars to navigate. They can't even see the sun to tell what time of day it is. And so the crew loses hope. And they say, we've done everything we can. There's nothing else to do. We just sit here and we drown aboard our ship or it breaks apart and we drown in the sea. Completely lost hope. And I can imagine God saying in this moment, yes, that's exactly what I want. Absolute hopelessness. No one has any resources. No one has any hope. No one has somebody they can turn to. They don't have anything. You are all hopeless. Now I will announce my presence. 
one of the principles that God has used over and over and over again in his word is we see that he comes in response to man's absolute hopelessness to rock bottom moments and announces who he is. And he adjusts the man to do that for him. He had his man, Paul, who was probably just going along with it all saying, well, Lord, when is the time? It's going to happen soon, I imagine. When do you want me to speak up? Because remember, Paul didn't just want to go to Rome. He was promised by Jesus Christ in the flesh, in a prison cell, that he would preach in Rome. So Paul doesn't lose that hope. Verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, okay, not only are they in the storm day after day after day after day, no idea where they are, no idea how they're going to survive. They don't have food. Maybe they ran out of food. Maybe the foods was tossed overboard for some reason. Maybe it was swept overboard. Maybe it was so water-soaked they couldn't eat it. Maybe they're all just too seasick. We don't know, but for whatever reason, they're not eating. They're without food. And Paul stood up. Verse 21. <coughs> Paul stood up among them and said, Man, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. I love this. Paul is human. He can't resist that I told you so moment. It's beautiful. He says, I told you so. You should have listened. But also in saying that, he establishes the fact that he knew what he was talking about. Yeah, it's really annoying to hear, I told you so, but you have to admit, okay, they were right. They knew something I didn't know. I was wrong. So Paul establishes some credibility here. Now listen to this, verse 22. Yet now I urge you to take heart, be of courage here, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you. Be comforted, because there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. The ship will get damaged, the ship might break, but you will all live. In other words, you know while you're hanging on to the mast like this, and the ship is teetering back and forth, and the waves are smashing over the top of the boat and almost washing you overboard, and you can't see anything. Paul comes to that, in that moment with the waves crashing over them and says, Cheer up. There will be no loss of any man's life. Not only will the ship not break apart, but not a single one of you will lose grip as the waves crash over you and fall overboard. Verse 23. He's continuing to talk here. He says, For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. Remember, he's talking to pagans. There is no monotheism in the mind of these people. They're all praying to whatever gods they can think of, whatever gods of the sea they can think of, and whatever gods of travel they can think of. And they're praying to them, and they're longing for them, but they've lost hope. Those gods didn't answer, but Paul says, the God that I serve, the God that I worship, that I belong to, the one God, he has not abandoned me. And here's some hope. There will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. They're looking for a God, and their gods don't help them, but there's one God left who will. Verse 24, and he said, do not be afraid. Paul, so he's saying, this is what the angel of the Lord told me. He told me, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. He's saying, guys, I'm not worried. Maybe you haven't noticed, but I've been fine for the most part. A little scary, I guess, but I'm confident because I know I'm going to Rome. And the angel of the Lord assured me right now in this moment tonight that I will stand before Caesar. And the good news is, because you're with me, God has you too. There's a tremendous point to be made here. Maybe we'll make it more next week, but tremendous point to be made here that simply being a person of faith in a community of unbelievers protects those unbelievers to a certain extent. The fact that God has a plan for you 
that God has works that he has created from the, before the foundation of the world to give to you, gives a certain level of protection to you and to those around you. There's a benefit to being a community of people with a believer in the center. She says, take heart, do not be afraid. I'm guaranteed to go to Rome and God will take you with me. Verse 25 and 26. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. A little bit of bad news there, but you're going to be okay. It's going to be fine. You're going to live, but we're going to crash soon, so be prepared for that. At this point, hitting an island without any way to see or navigate, really, it's bad news to hit an island, but it's also good news because doing that, even intentionally finding an island in this situation would be like finding a needle in a haystack. It's essentially impossible. It's impossible for these men to try to find an island and to try to hit an island. And yet the one who can see, the one who is the navigator and the captain and the owner of our lives, he sees and he can bring them to an island. The only way they survive is by the grace and the mercy and the leading of the God to whom Paul belongs. And Paul wants them to know that they can go to him to know about God, that he establishes himself here as a connection to God, as a powerful moment in the lives of these people. And God is setting himself up to establish his credibility. Paul is confident that what God says will happen will happen. But these people, they don't know this God. So you know what happens? It's one of two things. Either what God said would happen happens, it's true, or it doesn't come true. And you know the probability of landing on an island, losing the ship, losing the cargo, and yet every single life is spared. That's staggering. It's in the millions that all those things would come to pass. You see, God is setting up a display of himself a powerful display and miracle for these sailors and soldiers. And that's the promise. So what happens? What happens next is something that we will look at next week. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the journey and the places and the map. I thank you for the details we can get about seamanship in ancient times and Lord, I thank you for the most important character in this story, and that's you, Lord. I thank you because you are the one who is sovereign over all things. There is not a single drop of rain or drop from the ocean that wet their clothes in those days that you did not ordain. That hopelessness that utter despair, that fear. Lord, you allowed that. You allowed that so that they could come forth from that being dramatically changed and dramatically different. These were men who were just going about their lives and, and without hope, and yet perhaps they forgot that. Perhaps they didn't truly understand that until they got to the point where they were utterly and absolutely and undeniably hopeless. And yet you, Lord, step in and you give them hope. What a parallel for our lives, Lord. I pray that we would see that. That we would see that we were tossed to and fro in the winds and the waves. That we were adrift. That we were hopeless. That we had no anchor. That we had no sails. That sin and despair and brokenness and death were all consuming and we're the only thing in sight, and yet you stepped in. You calmed the storm through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as he defeated all the evil, all the brokenness of this life on the cross. He brought that to the grave with him, and he rose again without it. He left those things buried that we might find some freedom in his life from sin and ultimately freedom from death and sin as we look to eternity. Lord, I'm so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and the miracle he has worked in my life. I'm thankful, Lord, 
that you ordain all things for my good because you love me. And you do that very same thing for each and every person right now praying with me. Lord, we pray these things and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.